Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, episode 19, Belgium. This episode's alcohol of choice was the Rochefort No. 10 beer. Now, the beer is what is known as Trappist beer, or beer produced by Trappist monks. The Trappist monks are a Catholic order of monks, who are noted both apparently for being very, very quiet, and also producing goods that are used to provide for their monastery, community, and for charity. The Rochefort Brewery is located in Belgium, with the number 10 beer supposedly one of the best beers in the world. My thoughts? Well, I'm not really a beer guy, and honestly, if I was offered to have one again, I'd probably say no. However, Duval and Lambert beer are, in my opinion, better Belgian beers. So if you want to get something from Belgium, get those. Let's move on from my bad takes on beer and talk about Belgium's geography. The Kingdom of Belgium is located in Western Europe. With the North Sea, not north of it, but actually west of it, the Netherlands are north of it, Germany is to the east, Luxembourg to the southeast, and France to the south. Belgium is located in a region of Europe known as the Low Countries. This area is mainly noted for, unsurprisingly, being low and flat. The area around the border with Germany is a little more hilly, but even then, there's pretty much no mountains in the country. The country is mostly temperate, with clouds being a common sight in the country, and relatively cool temperatures for most of the year. While I'll talk more about the country's confusing political geography later in the episode, for right now know that the country is a federation, divided between three main geographic entities. There's Flanders in the north, Wallonia in the south, and the capital city of Brussels, which is kind of in the middle of the country, although it is all surrounded by Flanders. There is also a region that is technically not its own region, but is distinctive nonetheless. The region of Epon Melendi is located on the border with Germany, and is technically within the Wallonia region. Normally, I would start talking about the ethnic groups in the country, but it's easier to first bring up the languages of Belgium. There are three official languages, Dutch, French, and German. It is usually broken down with 58% speaking Dutch, 40% speaking French, and less than 1% speaking German. However, many people in the country can speak multiple languages, with most people knowing at least French and Dutch. The regions of Belgium are often connected to these three linguistic groups. Flanders is where Dutch speakers live, Wallonia is where French speakers live, Epon Melendi is where German speakers live, and Brussels is mostly made up of French speakers, although there is a strong Dutch minority. Languages like English, Spanish, Arabic, and Italian are also often spoken as either a first, second, or third language. Also, Dutch and French in Belgium often is slightly different to their counterparts in the Netherlands and France. Sometimes Flemish and Wallonian is considered a dialect, or it's considered its own language, depending on who you ask. Ethnically, Dutch speakers are often called Flemings, and French speakers are usually called Wallonians. German speakers are just called German. Other ethnic groups in the country are usually made up of a combination of other European groups, like Italians, Romanians, Poles, or Dutch and French people from the Netherlands and France itself, or they are likely from Africa or the Middle East. This can include Moroccans, Congolese, Syrians, Algerians, and Turks. Many of these other ethnic groups move for work-related reasons, and often live in either Brussels or other urban areas, and usually will choose to speak French over Dutch. Religion-wise, the country is mostly Christian, with somewhere between 55-65% to 65 being Catholic with Flanders and rural Wallonia having the highest concentration of them. Protestants are around 3-6%, while Orthodox Christians are less than 2% of the population. Islam is fairly large in Belgium, compared to other Western European countries, with 3-7% being Muslim, mostly Sunni. Buddhism, Judaism, Confucianism, and Antonism are also present. A large percentage of the population is also irreligious, with 20-30% holding no religious beliefs. Finally, there are around 11.5 million people in the country, and with that, we can start talking about this dysfunctional country's history. Belgium would see various people groups come and go starting in 10,000 BCE. Eventually, Indo-European people groups would emerge, and by the 400s BCE, Celtic groups would emerge as the dominant group in the area. One of these various Celtic tribes would be the Belgae, which is where Belgium gets its name from. Julius Caesar would take the territory in 22 BCE and would become an important province in the Roman Empire. Christianity would arrive in the regions in the 300 CE, converting much of the population. Roman rule would come to an end with the invasion of the Germanic tribes, who would settle in the region in the 400s. 
and which is where the origins of the modern people groups of Belgium would come from. Belgium during the Middle Ages would be divided between a series of small duchies and princely states. This would include the County of Flanders, the County of Namur, and the Prince Bishopric of Liège. These small states would see themselves torn politically and economically between the Kingdom of France to the south and the Holy Roman Empire to the east. Areas with a closer connection to the Holy Roman Empire remain more Germanic and would eventually be the areas where Dutch and German was spoken, while those that had closer ties with France would become Romanized and eventually would start speaking French. At several points, France, the Holy Roman Empire, and local lords would battle over the territory. One instance was the Franco-Flemish War, which was fought between 1297 to 1305. The war would see the Battle of the Golden Spurs, which saw Flemish pikemen defeat a force of French knights. While this battle wouldn't really matter, as three years later Flanders had to surrender, the Flemish victory did help keep Flanders as separate from France, and would become an important cultural symbol to the Dutch speakers in the north. Most of Belgium would by 1384 fall under the French noble family, the House of Vaux Burgundy. It would see commerce, arts, and trade flourish, as the area grew rich from new trade blocks formed in northern and western Europe, and the Burgundian centralized state power. Belgium, along with most of the Low Countries, would be given to the Austrian Habsburgs in 1482. The Habsburgs would seek to entrench Catholicism in the region, which was successful in most of modern-day Belgium, but would mostly fail in the Netherlands, which would become more Protestant. In 1556, the Austrian Habsburgs would hand over the Low Countries to Spain, which was also run by the Habsburgs. The Spanish doubled down on the attempt to Catholicize the region and limited the autonomy the region had. This upset many and began the Dutch Revolt. The Dutch Revolt is often characterized as just Protestant Netherlands revolting, but in mostly Catholic Belgium, anti-Spanish sentiment did exist. While this sentiment was particularly felt in the Protestant community of the region, many local lords were also upset with the efforts to limit autonomy, and parts of Belgium would come under open revolt. The Dutch rebels would take as far south as Namur, but Spanish forces would drive the rebels back, and by war's end in 1648, the Spanish would retain control of what is now Belgium and Luxembourg, while the Netherlands would become independent. Spanish rule would end in 1714 in the Treaty of Rastatt. This ended the War of Spanish Secession, and Belgium was given to Austria in the treaty. Austria was given the territory not really because they wanted it, but mostly because if they didn't, it would then go to France. And none of the other European powers at the time wanted France to expand. Austrian rule of the territory was characterized mostly by the Austrians begging the remaining European powers to take it off their hands. The territory was far away from any other Austrian territory, and it was very costly to hold and defend. Literally every single conference the Austrians went to, they just bothered people about getting rid of Belgium. In 1784, the Austrian Empire Joseph II came to the throne, and decided to implement liberal reform throughout his empire. Joseph and Belgium worked to reduce the power of the church, the local nobility, and guild associations, or, in other words, pretty much everyone who had some power in the area. This led to the local nobility and its conservative supporters to revolt in 1789, starting the Brabant Revolution. The rebels would form the United Belgian States, and would be the first real attempt at Belgian statehood. This state would, however, suffer from political infighting. Not like that would ever happen in Belgium today. And by the end of 1790, the states would fall back into Austrian hands. Also during this time, the Prince Bishopric of Liège, which was pretty much the only part of Belgium not under Austrian control and had remained independent, also suffered with revolt. The rebels in Liège wanted to overthrow the autocratic bishops who ran the country, and very often had little actual ties to Liège. The rebels would form the Republic of Liège in 1789, before being defeated by the Austrian and pro-bishop forces in 1791. The Brabant Revolt would catch the eye of the French, who were also undergoing a revolution, albeit for very different reasons. They saw the revolution in Belgium as another group of revolutionaries fighting back against a tyrannical tyrant. In 1792, the French would invade Belgium, beginning the French Revolutionary Wars. While at first the French army failed to take the territory, as the French army grew more organized, French commanders saw more success in the field, and by 1795 all of Belgium would be completely taken by France where it would remain under French control throughout the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars. The final battle of the Napoleonic Wars, Waterloo, would actually take place in Belgium. In 1815, as the European powers were redrawing the map of Europe, it was decided that the Dutch should get their turn at running Belgium. The Dutch king, William of Orange, 
was the first Dutch ruler to hold complete control of the Low Countries and hoped to use his new position to increase his power. He began building up and industrializing Belgium. This was good for him, but not so much for the people of Belgium, many of whom found themselves thrust into urban areas with unclean working conditions, low wages, and a tough working environment. William also began a policy of favoring Protestants and Dutch speakers, upsetting many of the established local elites in the area that were mainly Catholic and spoke French. Finally, he gave the Belgians reduced representation in the Dutch Parliament. While over 60% of the new Dutch Kingdom was found in Belgium, the Belgians only had 50% of the seats in Parliament. This all led to a strange coalition of proto-socialist workers, Catholic priests and their followers, French-speaking elites, and middle-class liberals all to oppose William's rule in Belgium. It is said in August 25th, 1830, a play was put on in Brussels that featured a stirring nationalistic and patriotic speech against unjust authority. Those in the audience were said to be so moved by the speech that they along with a group of workers took over Brussels from the Dutch, starting the Belgian Revolution. By October 4th, most of Belgium was under rebel hands, and independence was declared. The European powers were still wary of the destruction the Napoleonic Wars brought, and didn't want the revolution in Belgium to blow up into a new war. France wanted to annex Belgium, while many other European powers wanted the Dutch to retain control of the country. There was at one point a plan to divide Belgium between Prussia, the Netherlands, Britain, and France, but this failed to go anywhere. Eventually, the majority of European powers gathered around the idea that Belgium should be independent, hoping to make Belgium a neutral country that would work well with everyone, which would make it impossible for any other country to invade it, and if any of them did, I mean, they would go to war, so obviously no one would want to invade it. Please note the very subtle and intelligently done foreshadowing that I'm doing right now. But the Dutch weren't happy with this. William saw over half of his country get torn away from him, and he would invade Belgium in August 1831. While initially successful, he would be forced to retreat once he heard the French were planning on militarily aiding the Belgians. The Netherlands would lose their last fortress of Antwerp in 1832, and eventually in 1839 they would be forced to recognize Belgian independence. Belgium would emerge as a constitutional monarchy, with a parliament and limited democracy. The first king of the Belgians would be Leopold I. Leopold was from the noble house of saxe coburg and Gotha, a German dynasty, that still holds the crown of Belgium today. Leopold was chosen to be the king of the Belgians, mainly because he was seen as a fairly neutral candidate to most of the European powers, and none of them hated him too much. Leopold's reign would see economic development in Wallonia and neutrality in European affairs. Belgium was politically divided between three main factions, or pillars. The first would be the Catholic Conservative Pillar. This pillar was dominated by priests, bishops, and rural farmers, who wanted to protect tradition and the church's role in society and education, hoped for increased power to go towards the king, and sought the development of the rural economy, while also largely backing the new capitalist system that was developing in the country. They would dominate Belgian politics from 1830 to 1848, and 1884 to the First World War. As time went by, the Catholics began to see Christian democratic ideals become more popular, arguing for increased democracy and labor reform along Christian humanist lines. The next pillar would be the liberal pillar. This pillar was dominated by the middle class and bourgeois capitalists. The liberals wanted to expand democracy, although only to men, wanted to reduce the power the king and church had in society, wanted to continue the development of industrialization and the capitalist system, backed major industries in the country, and generally opposed labor reform. They would dominate politics from 1848 to 1884. The liberals would be divided between a more progressive wing and a conservative wing. Finally, the third pillar was the socialist pillar. This pillar was mainly made up of urban workers and the radical intelligentsia. They opposed capitalism in the country, demanding greater labor reform and workers' rights wanted a complete overhaul to the political system, and opposed religion's role in society. While they never controlled the country prior to World War I, they would see steady growth and become more moderate the closer to power they got. Important differences began to emerge between French and Dutch speakers. French-speaking elites held most of the political power at the start of Belgian independence, and with the increasing development of French Wallonia, the Wallonians held most of the economic power in the country. Dutch was seen as a backwards language, and French was used as the language of politics and business in the country. Brussels, which was traditionally Dutch-speaking, would see more and more of the population speaking French. Today, almost 80% of the city speaks French, while only a little over 20% can speak Dutch. Politically, you can also see a divide, with Flanders mostly voting Catholic, while Wallonia tended to vote Socialist. 
The 19th century would see many European powers establishing a colonial empire, and Belgium wanted in on the colonial action. The second king of Belgium, Leopold II, wanted Belgium to join the other great powers as an important imperial powerhouse, and he planned on Belgian colonies all around the world. The list of colonies he intended to take was honestly staggering. He hoped for Belgian colonies in Wisconsin, Texas, Florida, Mexico, Costa Rica, Haiti, Argentina, the Faroe Island, Portugal, North Africa, West Africa, Ethiopia, India, Australia, New Zealand, Hawaii, and many, many more. None of these would really work out because they were either controlled by a European power, it was impossible to get there by water, or in the case of Portugal, it was a colonial power. But hey, points for him for dreaming big. Belgium would get one colony in Africa, though, in what is now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Congo was given to Belgium by other European powers in 1885, mainly because they saw Belgium as a neutral country, and it was generally thought war would break out if any other country tried to take the Congo. I won't talk too much about Belgium rule in the Congo, mainly because I'll do that in the DRC episode, but to put it bluntly, it was pretty bad. The country was run by Leopold as his own personal fiefdom, and the native Africans were routinely tortured in what was essentially wide-scale slavery. The Belgian state would have to take control away from Leopold in 1905, due to international pressure on the atrocities being committed. The Belgian state did treat the Congolese a little bit better, but not by a whole lot. The Congo would prove to be a very rich colony, providing the Belgians with natural resources, allowing the Belgian economy to grow. In 1914, World War I would break out. Germany and France were at war, and Germany decided that they could surprise and crush the French forces if they invaded the country through Belgium. Germany invaded the country in August 1914, and while the Belgians put up a good fight, they were unable to defeat the numerically superior German. Almost the entire country was occupied by the Germans, with only a small section of Flanders remaining under Belgian hands. Now remember that Belgium was officially created as a neutral state, that everyone was supposed to get along with. This invasion into Belgium gave Britain the pretext it needed to declare war on Germany, helping ensure that the Germans would have to fight the UK and France on the Western Front. Belgian troops would continue to fight despite the occupation of most of the country. The King of Belgium, Albert I, helped lead the Belgian government and army for the next four years, trying to keep morale high. Belgian troops would also participate in the Battle of Ypres and the Hundred Days Offensive. There would also be limited Belgian involvement in the East African Campaign, the Eastern Front, and in naval battles throughout the war. The war would further see the divide between the Flemish and Walloonians. Many Flemish soldiers found themselves being run by French-speaking officers that couldn't speak a single word of Dutch to them, helping create confusion on the battlefield. Many Flemish troops formed the Front Movement that advocated for Dutch to be given an equal status. This was met with distrust by the mostly French military elite. In occupied Belgium, there were some Dutch speakers who decided to work with the German occupiers, hoping that if the Germans won the war, Flanders could become an independent state free from Wallonian rule. However, this wouldn't come to pass, as by 1918 Germany was defeated and all of Belgium was liberated. The end of the war would see Belgium gain some new territories. First in Africa, it gained a part of German East Africa, the modern-day states of Burundi and Rwanda. They also would in Europe gain Epon Melendi, this area was put under Belgian occupation. A referendum was held in the territory on if they wanted to join Belgium. This passed, although apparently in order to vote against this, you had to publicly out yourself, something that many people chose not to do with all the occupying soldiers hanging around. But despite these new territories, Belgium wasn't exactly in the best state post-war. The German occupation had left much of the country in ruins, and rebuilding the country's economy and infrastructure was badly needed. Along with this, the country was way more divided. The linguistic divide became more pronounced, as an increasing number of Flemish demanded autonomy, while Wallonians called these Flemish nationalists traitors. Far-right parties began to emerge on the scene. The South saw the Rexis Party, which argued for a unitary Belgium and wanted the king and church to dominate, and wanted Belgium to become a corporatist society. In the north, there was the Flemish National Union, or VNV, that argued that Flanders should leave Belgium and join the Netherlands, and while not initially fascist, they drifted closer to fascism as the years went by. World War II would again see Belgium be invaded. While Belgium tried to remain as a neutral country, Germany invaded in May 1940, hoping to cut through Belgium similar to its plan in World War I. 
Belgian forces were unprepared, and by June, all the country was in German hands. The king, Leopold III, surrendered the country to Germany, much to the anger of the government, which opposed surrender and fled to London. Leopold would remain a prisoner for the remainder of the war. While most of the Belgian army and government had been captured, a small number had escaped to London, or its colonies, while they formed the Belgian government in exile, and the Free Belgian Forces. They would try to conduct propaganda to encourage resistance to German rule and provide valuable resources from the Congo. Belgian troops, and particularly colonial troops, would also participate in the Battle of the Atlantic, the East African Campaign, Operation Overlord, the Battle for Burma, and the liberation of Belgium in 1944. Life in German-occupied Belgium would see the Jews, Roma, and anti-Nazi activists rounded up and killed. It is estimated around 24,000 were killed in the Holocaust. Belgian manufacturing would be forced to work with the Nazis, and many would have to build bombs and weapons for the occupiers. Epon Melendi itself would be reintegrated back in Germany, with many residents of the region happy to be back in the greater German nation. Both the Rexis and the V&V would work with the Nazis, although they both had very different goals. They would serve as either administrators, in the police forces, or fighting with the German army on the Eastern Front. Resistance emerged to Nazi rule, with many refusing to work or participate in Belgian society while the Nazis occupied the country. Violent resistance would also emerge, with various groups springing up, coming from a variety of political positions. You had communists, socialists, liberals, Christian democrats, royalists, and even some hard right groups take up arms against the Nazis. They would target infrastructure in the country, try and help Jews and refugees flee the country, and create propaganda up until the day the country was liberated. With Belgium free by 1944, an important question would have to be asked. What should happen with the king? Many in the government in exile felt that the king had given up the country and didn't fight hard enough for it. They wanted Leopold to abdicate the throne and, depending on who you ask, either give up the throne to someone else in the royal family or for Belgium to become a republic. The king's supporters argued, however, that the king was put in a bad situation, and they tried to ask for the release of political and military prisoners while captured. The divide in Belgian society was split between the Flemish, who largely backed the king, and the Walloonians, who largely opposed the king. In case you're wondering if any issue in Belgium doesn't involve a linguistic divide, no, they pretty much all do. From 1944 to 1950, the king would remain in exile in Austria. A referendum was held, which did have almost 58% of the voters asking for his return to the country, but it didn't end the crisis. When Leopold returned in 1950, a massive strike broke out in Wallonia that sought to force the king back into exile. When four strikers were shot dead by the police, it killed any chance of Leopold remaining on the throne. He would leave the country he had so briefly returned to, and his son Boudon would take the throne. The crisis helped further divide the country, and also significantly reduced the power the monarchy had in Belgian policymaking. Belgium post-war would see large changes for the country. The Marshall Plan saw Belgium receive millions in American funds to help rebuild the country. Most of these funds went to Flanders, greatly building up that region, while Wallonia began to lag behind economically. Ironically, a reversal of the past hundred years of Belgian history. Belgium would lose its colonies in the 60s, mainly due to rising costs in maintaining these far-off lands and African resistance to colonial rule. Progressive social movements began to emerge in the country starting in the 60s, with secularism and women's rights being some of the main driving points of these new movements. The 70s would start to see an increase of immigrants entering the country, especially Muslim immigrants. And most importantly, the Belgian waffle would be created in 1958 for the World Fair that year that occurred in Brussels. Belgium would also find itself as one of the leading voices of European integration. It would be a founding member of both the EU and NATO, with both headquartered in Brussels. The country is seen as a strong advocate of both Western democracy and capitalism on the world stage. This further integration into the European market helped make Belgium very wealthy, and today the country is one of the richest in Europe. By the 60s, the tension between the Flemish and Walloonians would reach a breaking point, and the country became a federal state. The country would be split into three different regions, Flanders, Wallonia, and Brussels. The country would also be split into three different communities, the Dutch-speaking community, the French-speaking community, and the German-speaking community. These three communities and regions all have equal power to each other and the federal government. This can create very complicated situations. Imagine, for example, you are a French speaker living just outside of Brussels. This means you have to rely and work with regulations, taxes, and resource distribution 
from the federal government, the French-speaking community government, the Flanders government, the Brussels government, and likely a local municipality government. This complicated situation, along with a series of political scandals and corruption trials in the 90s, have surprisingly made a lot of people upset with the state of things in Belgium. The three main political pillars would be split along linguistic lines. So, for example, there is a liberal Dutch-speaking party, a liberal French-speaking party, and a liberal German-speaking party. Although, the German speakers are usually forgotten about in Belgian politics, so their parties aren't often thought of. There also are the Flemish nationalist parties, that have emerged on the scene arguing for Flanders to break free of Belgium and either become independent or join the Netherlands. While initially, Flemish nationalists would emerge from all across the political spectrum, today most Flemish nationalists are decidedly right-wing, with a moderate New Flemish alliance being conservative and the radical Flemish interest party being hard-right populist. Since the 80s, environmentalist, anti-nationalist Marxist, and French-speaking chauvinist all have also emerged onto the scene. Also, while Flemish nationalism is the main separatist force in the country, you can also find French speakers who argue for Wallonia to separate and possibly join France. Some German speakers and German nationalists also argue for Germany to bring Epon Melendi back into the country. However, these remain small, especially compared to Flemish separatism, which has gotten very large. Largely due to historical discrimination against Dutch speakers, the fear of French speakers' encroachment on established language boundaries, especially in and around Brussels, and the belief that Flanders could do better economically if it was on its own. Today it's believed around 40% of Dutch speakers are in favor of independence. The complicated and segregated nature of Belgian politics has made it very difficult for parties after an election to form a government. Parties often don't have enough seats to form a government on their own. For example, in the Belgian parliament today, the largest party, the New Flemish Alliance, has only 24 out of 150 seats in the parliament. After the latest election in May of 2019, it took almost 500 days, or until October of 2020, until a new government could be formed. This wasn't, however, the longest time ever it has taken to form a government. In 2010, it took 541 days to form a new government, making it the longest time ever a country has operated without a defined government. The current leader of the country is Prime Minister Alexander de Croo, a member of the Dutch-speaking Liberal Party. He is also backed by the French-speaking Liberals, the Social Democrat and Environmentalist parties, and the Dutch-speaking Christian Democrats. De Croo has spent most of his rule working to ease the country through the coronavirus, and dealing with the EU negotiations on vaccine rollout. The monarchy is still present in Belgium, with the current king, King Philippe, ruling the country since 2013. Philippe largely has stayed out of politics, although he has played a role in facilitating the formation of governments after the 2014 and 2019 election. So why does Belgium exist? Belgium is a country that it seems, in some ways, nobody wants to be a part of. It's a very divided nation that in many ways was created and formed by international players for their own gains. If any country in the world was going to break up, I would honestly bet my money on Belgium breaking up at some point. But it also should be noted that Belgium is a rich country, and despite all the linguistic tension, is mostly stable, especially compared to other countries we have talked about. They are one of the most developed countries in the world, and the headquarters of various international organizations and companies are located in the country. So, maybe I'm wrong, and this non-country will make me look like an idiot and stick around for a while. We'll just have to see. The next country we will go to is Belize. We'll go to our first Central American country, but prepare for the English language, runaways, territorial disputes, and surprisingly, the Amish. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed. So the next video I'm going to do is a video on the political parties of South Africa. Normally I would wait until I get to the South African video, but it was requested by Zethan Productions on YouTube, and I figured, why not? If you want me to make a video on something, you can comment it on YouTube, or you can email it to me, or something, and I might do it. After the South African political parties video, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, but I know I'll have Belize to do, of course. I know Rexis on YouTube recommended that I do the political parties of the Netherlands, so maybe I'll do that. I also have the remaining British Overseas Territories to do, so Gibraltar, uh, the bases on Cyprus, the British Indian Ocean Territories, and the Pitcairn Islands. And then because, of course, I just got done with Belgium, I'll probably do an episode on Belgian political parties at some point. But thank you all for watching. It's been almost a year since I started uploading videos, and it's crazy that, like, I'm still doing it. I appreciate everyone that has watched, even if it's just one video or it's all of them. It's just really, really cool to continually see this grow.
But thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. You can email me at whydocountriesexist at gmail.com for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. The sources I use for this video are Ellis Wheatley, Jane... I'm going to butcher this. Cranbeek and Alan Maynan's book, Political History of Belgium from 1830 onwards. Europa Lex reports on the Belgian political parties for the 2019 election. Geography Now's video, Belgium. Half as interesting video, how Belgium has gone 621 days without a government. But also I think they were wrong with that one. I don't think it was 621 days. History Matters video, how did Belgium get an empire and why does Belgium exist? History with Herbert's video, Why is Belgium so divided? Coin Van Roy's video, Belgium for Dummies. Mr. History's video, A Super Quick History on Belgium. The Great War's video, Belgium under German occupation during World War I. And the First Soldier of Belgium, King Albert. The Revolution's podcast episodes, Season 3, Episode 22, War. And Season 6, Episode 8B, The Belgian Revolution. Volga Mapping's video, what each nation wanted from the scramble of Africa, Wikipedia, and finally, World War II's video, Hitler Strikes West and the Invasion of the Benelux.